pray that our children would not be included in this or that our grandchildren would not be included in this and we all work very hard all of our lives to make sure that's not the case. But this is the legacy we're leaving them. This is the legacy we're choosing to leave them. This election is a moment to decide whether that election is worthy of them. To conclude, I want to go back to the original slide. There's a way of understanding this demographic, and many of us understand this demographic as suggesting major shifts in the American population. Absolutely true. Potential shifts in the future. There's a way in which many of us understand these data as suggesting that our country has to make some very difficult choices about how it understands itself and the extent to which it wants to validate difference or the extent to which it wants to avoid increasing difference that characterizes our country. But notice that these lines are coming together. And what it suggests to me is that we have an opportunity in exercising for those of us who can, for those of us who are citizens, our right to vote and our right to exercise our responsibilities of citizenship, we have the opportunity to think about in deciding who we support and what standards we hold them to, whoever we support, whether or not we want to be part of a community that comes together in the fashion of linked fate and common destiny, or whether we want to exercise our vote choices in a way that might suggest that our country needs to pull itself even further apart. Linked fate and common destiny. is the future our children will live in. Linked fate and common destiny. Linked fate and common destiny are, I think, what we can, through this election, think about leaving as a legacy to our children and our grandchildren, depending upon which set of choices we make. At Notre Dame, we talk about um, religion, for those of you, in addition to football. Um, we, we talk, uh, actually football, well, no, I shouldn't say that. Um, I was going to say football is a religion. Um, we talk about religion. And one of the fundamental tenets of the Congregation of Holy Cross, that is the order of priests that runs Notre Dame, for those of you who think Notre Dame is Jesuit, you're absolutely wrong. And, and everybody at Notre Dame is offended when you think it's a Jesuit institution. One of the fundamental tenets of their uh, belief is a belief in divine providence. Divine providence is the idea that, if you'll permit me, God places us in circumstances on purpose. What if these changing demographics are part of a challenge we have, whatever its origins, whether spiritual or not, a challenge we have to decide what kind of a legacy we want to leave the next generation. I say in conclusion, without a doubt, that we will make a very strong statement in this election when we exercise our um, rights uh, to vote for what kind of a legacy we will leave our children our, and our grandchildren, whether we will build communities of linked fate and common destiny or something else. I hope and I pray that we leave a legacy that we're proud of and that we would want to leave to the next generation. Thank you very much. Now I'm ready to take your questions. And if you have any hard ones, 
um, I will leave them to your president um, <laughs> to answer. <laughs> yes, question here in the back. Oh, uh, there's a microphone. This is, being, this is being taped, so. Oh, great. Um, Be careful so what I, you say. Okay. <laughs> I was curious, could you give us your opinion on why we have such trouble getting high registration rates yeah. with our Latino yeah. and Asian yeah. friends? Yeah, yeah. Um, there are some studies that show that the most effective way to mobilize Latino voters, get them to naturalize, get them to register, is personal contact by a co-ethnic. That is, you need to have people who are recognizable in your community, right? Latino communities. And I use the word communities on purpose, right? Because of the rec acknowledging the diversity of our communities, right? You have to have those folks knocking on the doors. I think another thing that we can do that will be very clear and very easy, well, not easy, but very clear and very possible, is to increase the instruction of what I call active civics in our middle and high school. We have it's an interesting, interesting um, reality. We have experienced a decline in the teaching of active participatory civics since the 1970s. You know who was behind that? Liberals. What? Liberals? Why wouldn't they want an engaged citizenry? Because there was the attitude taken as a result of the Vietnam War that government was corrupt. That you couldn't trust what government said. Sound familiar? Couldn't trust what government said. Government wasn't really going to tell us the truth, so we don't want to value participation. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying this was a conscious decision made by a curriculum committee, right? But, but there was a sense that this wasn't important to teach. It was important to teach about other things. We have since our focus on our students in middle and high schools passing more and more standardized tests and even further push away from the extent to which, notice what I'm suggesting here, we consider going back to an understanding of citizenship with its origins in the early 20th century that said immigrants from Europe need to become more American in order to better contribute to our society. I think we might be sophisticated enough now to engage in that reconsideration. There are some efforts to do that. Some states now, California is an example, allow for pre-registration. That is, you can register to vote when you're 16, 17. I have a dream, if any of you have foundation money, let me know. I have a dream that we will have a school competition to see who can register the most parents who are eligible, no voter fraud, who can register the most parents to vote. That is a school competition because schools are places of significant identity and the children, the students, take responsibility for registering the adults and the message that they send those adults is, I need you to do this for me. I need you to do this for my future. There are ways in which I think we can develop and create that type of inactive civics. I have a, a brief op-ed on the website of the Aspen Institute and their Latinos in Society program where I outline some of these ideas for how to better engage. The focus is Latino youth, but, but the reality is if you try to engage more Latino youth, like African American youth or white youth, you engage more youth overall because you're sensitizing an entire system to the need to provide more opportunities for us to, in fact, engage. Long-winded answer, sorry. Yeah, question. Okay, um, so your, your discussion of the paradox of inclusion kind of got me thinking about the current circumstances in, in the election. And um, if we think about the failure or, or the problem that comes about through that paradox is that the political system isn't delivering the results for those constituencies in, as measured maybe by child poverty or lots of so other things, other education men. rate, you know, success. Um, I was thinking about this particular election and how there are these blocks of voters that showed up in the primary season, the, pri the Bernie supporters, yep. and then the, and yep. a lot of the people yep. that are yep. on, the, on the right, yep. I see that they can, they can see that same problem of the paradox of inclusion. And have you looked at that? So like, it's kind of, you know, that they're not getting the result from the political system that they want. They're disaffected, yeah. they're upset. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, I know that's probably not necessarily yeah. something you're yeah. studying, no, but no. I see that as a, no. as a possibility the as well. 
The reason I focus in this presentation on the generational shifts and generational ideas, begin to hint at that. What we saw in this election was something I think that, that none of us anticipated. Maybe Bob Stein did, but I didn't anticipate. <laughs> that there would be groups of young voters, if you will, on the left and on the right, who would say the system somehow, I'm not going to say rigged, the system somehow is not functioning properly. And I want a candidate who seems to challenge that system from the right and from the left. And I think it's a call to us as voters, because remember, millennials and younger voters tend not to vote very much, consistently vote. At least there seems to be evidence there. It's a call to those of us who do vote more regularly and to participate, to think about how we can understand and address the concerns that they have and provide them with leaders that might be more able to help them live their dreams. What are the two most important issues to millennials, according to public opinion polls? What's the maximum age you can be to be a millennial? <laughs> a lot of people in this room don't qualify. <laughs> 35, more or less. 32, 35, thereabouts, right? Two most important issues, right? No. <laughs> two, two most important public policy issues. In there. <laughs> Their latest Facebook post. No, that's not true. Um, college debt, right? College debt. What's the other one? Jobs. Employment. What are our candidates doing in saying that? Well, they've got some ideas. Well, that, that's why they're responding. Will they, whoever's elected, actually come through and meet those efforts is a challenge. I'm involved as an advisor to a group called We the Voters. This is an organization out of New York, it's a production company, that has developed 25 videos that will go online, I believe, starting next week targeted at millennial voters that will be made available through 50 different social media sources. Facebook, Twitter, and so forth. It's a series of 25 four-minute videos that say not who to vote for, not which party to support, but that say this election is important to you and the issues you're concerned with are important to you and you need to engage. How do you do that? Well, I'll give you an example. So the first video, one of the first videos is, starts out with a scene, permit me here just for a couple minutes, starts out with a scene in a coffee shop in a place like New York City. And you have a barista, everybody know what a barista is, right? You know, the person who makes the coffee. Um, I call that me in our home, because I tend to be the one who makes the coffee. The barista goes to a customer, a woman, and says, um, hey, um, did you like your coffee? She says, yes. And um, he says, um, well, would you like to join me to go and vote? And her response in the video is, <laughs> permit me, oh, we're on tape. Um, oh, voting is what you call it now. <laughs> And so I read the script and I thought, what is this trash? Oh, said, what is this? Right? This is a, but I saw the video and it's very engaging. People are the same. So the, the barista says, well, I became a citizen um, a few years ago. This is the first chance I have to cast the vote. I really want to really cast my vote. Will you come with me? She said, nah, apparently I'm not going to get anything. So no, I don't think I'm going to go with you this time. So he then goes to the voting place. And on his way there, he's met by someone our age who says, why are you going to go vote? You people don't vote. You people vote by liking things on Facebook. You people vote by texting your friends. That's where you vote. Don't take any of this. This voting election stuff, that's not for you. That's for older people. And he said, but you know what the probability is that your individual vote will determine the outcome of the election? It's so small. And it doesn't matter anyway whether any of us vote. Then the barista opens the guy's jacket and notice that he has a big sticker on his shirt that says, I voted today. 
And so he then goes to the voting booth and I'm giving this a way of engaging millennial voters. He then goes to the voting booth and in the voting booth, um, the guy reappears and tries to convince him not to vote. He still says he's going to do it. And then the customer is there and said, I thought about what you said. And I'm going to come and vote. So let's go vote together. And they go into separate voting booths. They go and cast their votes. So the idea here is we need to do outreach and civic engagement for millennials in a very different way than we traditionally think of promoting civic engagement. We'll see if it has any impact in increasing the turnout that may occur. Question up there. If I come close to you, I'm not challenging you. It's just no, that my no, hearing has gone that. and I have hearing aids and it really helps me <laughs> to see your lips. No, I, so I teach 11th grade US history up at Aldine and uh, MacArthur High School. And we've been doing a lot with the election, my current events class. And we've been looking historically at the role of third parties. So do you foresee as the demographic shift is changing that we're going to see a weakening of a binary political system yeah, yeah. and seeing something that starts to spread out more like other European countries? Because the U.S. is very unique yeah. in, in yeah. the way our political system works. Um, probably not. And the reason is because of a structural condition that we have called first past the post, which means that the party that tends to win is the party who gets more than anybody else given the nature of our representational system. If we had a proportional representation system where parties ran lists, the, vote, the public votes, and then you get a distribution of seats like happens in many European democracies and many Asian democracies and, and a number of Latin American democracies, then there would be a reason for third parties to be there. Right now, the role of third parties in the United States is largely as spoilers, right? And, and there's, there's a way in which then that reality provides opportunities for both parties to shift to be able to capture the individuals that, that might have gone and supported of the third party. Um, I have a very good uh, high school textbook that you might consider for your class. Um, I happen to write it. Um, so I'm <laughs> selling you that book uh, right now. And I, <laughs> I wrote that book because I thought, as, as, as a recent introduction I had, <laughs> some admitted said, I wrote that book because I thought, you know, it's great that we do this high level scholarship. It's great that we publish in top journals. It's great that we write our, our excellent books. It's great that we, that we have these discussions. But maybe it's time for political scientists to also spend a little time focusing on better civic engagement where it matters for those younger generations. And the theme that I give to that book is the responsibilities of citizenship and the challenges of leadership in the 21st century. So I'm not doing that just solely for advertising, but I'm suggesting there's a way in which I think we have to rethink important elements of our role as adults in providing more opportunities for the next generations to become more civically engaged. Another question. Yes. Thank you very much. It's been a real treat, and thank you for, for coming here. Um, your description of the engagement of millennials, uh, getting them to vote, to understand the value of the vote, um, prompts me to ask the question. As many of the advocacy and civil society groups like the LULACs, the NCLRs, the GI forums, okay. the voter registration projects, uh, as uh, the African-American community is the faith-based community to be able to provide that kind of education and engagement and get out the vote activities. As they have fallen victim to the graying of America, the aging of America, what do you see to be the next type of outreach that is yeah. going to be needed yeah. to educate people yeah. given that we have vacated the space of civic education in our middle and junior schools? I, I think that leaders in, in these organizations and others, and all of us, have to take more responsibility for engaging and interacting and challenging the next generation. We're not good at, when we're leaders in our respective areas, we're not good at bringing up the next group of leaders. I think our country is paying a price for that. 
I think our country is paying a price for not investing and our having a public discourse that allows us to talk about what our responsibilities are to try to better engage that next generation. So my advice for those organizations would be great that the old guys get together and that the old women get together and that we've got our nice fundraisers and our scholarships and our parties and we file our lawsuits and we do all that because it's great stuff, important stuff, meaningless, unless you're also spending at least 50% of your time engaging the younger generation. Because if we don't do that, these sorts of challenges are what we have chosen to leave them without the skills, without the opportunities to do a much better job than we have done. Yes? So I have a question. Yes? Houston's already beyond this yes. statistic, 44% yep. in 2010 in terms of the Hispanic population in the city of Houston, yep. and yet gross underrepresentation in terms of council, representation on school boards, yep. Never electing a U.S. congressperson, never electing a Hispanic mayor. What's wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's wrong with you. Um, I have to say that until I get to catch my flight at four o'clock tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon. Um, obviously, Houston's not doing its job, and those of you who are adults here in Houston are not doing your job. It's, it's a hard thing. It's an easy thing for me to say since I don't live in Houston, but I think you can apply that to, to all of us, right? That is, um, evidence like that suggests that whatever we did in the past is not good enough. That we have to think, to be cliche, out of the box. We have to be less risk averse. We have to be more creative. We have to push ourselves harder to think about how to overcome those sorts of challenges. For the Latino community, we have the challenge, of course, of low participation generally, but we have the challenge of citizenship, we have the challenge of a younger population, right? But notice the data, that's why I like to refer to it, the younger population is the future, and it's 94% US citizen. Could that be part of the reason that we have such strong support in some segments of our electorate for voter identification laws? for making it more difficult for particular segments of our population to have access to registration forms and voter forms, or at least think that it might be more difficult. I'm not being partisan here. I'm being real in terms of larger consequences for the future of our society. Well, how do we try to mediate that? Well, there's a simple way to mediate that. I, I've, I've argued for years without any support <laughs> that we should have a national identification card. Most democratic nations have a national identification card where the government says, hey, this is you, this is where you live right now, and guess what? You're a citizen, and you're automatically registered to vote. Now, I understand our civil libertarian concerns and our civil libertarian history, but boy, would that increase our voter registration immediately and, and push more of us to say, and especially our parties and our candidates, to say, hey, maybe I should go and get some of those votes. Again, for Latinos, Latinos happen to be a community